What's the dinosaur's least favorite reindeer? Comet, of course. <laughs> oh, I am so droll. What better way to end the year than the top 10 of the best and 10 of the worst watches of 2023? Now, before we get into it, I must make this abundantly clear that this is just in my humble opinion. And also, obviously, I can't include every great release. This video would be about 50 hours long, but please share your favorites and least favorites in the comments, along with a reason why, which I always find the most interesting aspect. <laughs> Come on, I want to watch Die Hard. How many times do we have to watch Gremlins? How frightfully hilarious these little gremlin chaps are. That's more like it. Hashtag pure class. <laughs> Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. I apologize about my rather raspy voice. I'm sounding like a British Italian uh, Barry White, Barry Bianco. <laughs> so that's what you'll have to call me now. Uh, but yeah, I'll do a quick wristwatch check. I'm wearing the Zenith Defy. This is the Revival Shadow. I've borrowed it from my good friends at Shreve Crump and Low, and it's related to one of my uh, top 10 releases of the year. We'll get into that in just a moment. So let's start with my 10 favorite releases of 2023. Every single entry into this list, they are placed there by their own merits. Their own merits alone. You couldn't pay me all the money in the world to be in this list. If I'm not feeling it, if I don't feel with my heart and soul it deserves to be there, then it's not going to be. Uh, and that includes the brands as well. So with that said, let's get into it. At 10, it's Zenith, and it goes without saying, but I will anyway. I adore the new Sunburst Zenith Chronomaster Sport, and after reviewing the first one from a few years back, there's nothing much more to say here, other than for 2023 we see a steel bezel and that meraviglioso blue. Truthfully, I could have borrowed one from Shreve Crump and Low. Oh, and by the way, do check out their YouTube channel as well. But I suspect it would have been detrimental to my Grail watch savings. And not to mention, probably cause a divorce. So instead, I wanted to try something different. The Zenith Defy Revival Shadow certainly is that. Its angular case of the original predates Genta's Royal Oak. The skeletonized bracelet is very different indeed, and the matte blasted titanium case gives off a dramatically futuristic quality and feel. Undoubtedly a Marmite watch, but the reason I borrowed this was I wanted to highlight a point that the Chronomaster is rather conventional, but at the same time, Zenith is willing to try daring new things. My pick for number nine is the last independent German brand standing out of the five originals that made the real deal Fliegers during World War II. It's of course Laco with their DIN 8330. It gets its technical name from the rigorous standard of tests. Think of it as an even stricter German pilot's version of Amiga's Master Chronometer certification. And I dare to say it's perhaps the most significant watch in the brand's evolution since the 1930s. But most importantly, the result is a sharp looking, super capable pilot watch that encapsulates with supreme purity and unforgiving conviction everything Lacor and the words German made are revered for. At number eight, it's not just one watch, but an entire watch group. For 2023, there is one collection of brands that has done better than all the rest. The main reason, and you'll see from examples of their releases or just some of their releases this year, they listen to the watch enthusiast. And I think what they respond with in terms of the, the watches they put out is better than all their rivals. Number eight, and we are talking about the Citizen Group. 
With Bulova, we saw a return of the legendary fan favourite, the 666 Devil Diver, but this year, making use of their latest in-group movement, resulting in a logical, useful progression of the watch, a GMT variant for the first time. With Frédéric Constant, we saw a whole slew of in-house powered dressy numbers also covered on this channel that for the first time ever had me considering selling a kidney for their new tourbillon. Unequivocally the best affordable Swiss made tourbillon on the market. But crucially, why I adore FC is that you can never say they are anything but tastefully done. With increasingly garish fashion fads, with brands quick to jump on trends, I tend to gravitate towards, and forgive the unintended pun, something timeless or genuinely innovative and historic that does not cost as much as a house. Speaking of which, the real jewel in the Citizen Crown is still Accutron. As you guys know, I'm a massive fan of this particular brand. A perfect example is they recently released four new variations of their groundbreaking electrostatic technology with this Las Vegas casino inspired colorways. The DNA is a more contemporary sporty sibling of the iconic space view that we reviewed in the past. And then of course, let's not forget to mention a brand that always seems overlooked, Alpina, who celebrated 140 year anniversary this year with this gorgeous little number. At number seven is the first YouTuber to successfully not only start his own brand, but to train and become a watchmaker himself. He's able to assemble his timepieces from start to finish with his Made in Italy brand. We are of course talking about Marco Bracca, his really cool apneist 38 millimeter diver. Marco Bracca actually started his brand, I believe, in 2022, but as we've discussed, it takes a year or two to design, to test, fix prototypes, set up infrastructure, all the legal stuff, as well as countless other steps I neglect to mention to make a watch a reality. But the difference is between him and all those who followed his lead, and failed in my opinion, is that he did it right taking a year off YouTube to learn the craft under the mentorship of Cesare, and many of you know him as aka Amico Orologiaio. And then he made his debut at the start of 2023. I can't deny I've actually considered doing this myself, but it's just not for me. I love collaborating time to time with brands that I really enjoy. More so like a free agent. I adore the independence. And besides, right now, I do believe the micro brand world is very oversaturated and very derivative. But I want to congratulate Grande Marco, amico mio, un saluto, because he did it right. And guys, if you think I'm being too nice and uplifting and positive, don't worry. In a moment, I'm going to show you a Richard Mille that's retro inspired and looks like, well, saved by the bell threw up all over it. At six is a watch that has already existed for a while, since the 80s in fact, and was originally designed with US pilots at Kelly Air Force Base. We are of course talking about the Marathon Navigator, but what's different this time is the affordable mil-spec asymmetrical icon with tritium tube illumination is now finally back in steel and not the super lightweight fiber shell of before. Marathon are a highly respected independent Canadian brand and still family owned that produces Swiss made ultra reliable watches for the military all over the world. Unpretentious, historic, highly functional, accessible in price, this is the real McCoy when it comes to watches for the armed forces. Number five is the Hanhart Red X Blue and Grey Flyback Twin Sets. Now I've done many videos on this German heritage brand that makes premier quality chronographs, so have a look back. But in essence, we see a stunning limited edition duo with a manual wind column wheel actuated movement in only 140 pieces. These exclusive collectibles are very competitively priced and come in either a rich cobalt blue or in a majestic anthracite gray. You also get a stopwatch with a matching dial with that sunray finish, dashboard plate and table stand that honors their great lineage in sport timekeeping. And then their dashes of red, which is 
so indicative of the brand, is inspired by their signature red pusher. 39 millimeters of absolute pure class. If we put my own love and admiration for this brand aside, this is a very important release because what made Hanhart famous was the watches they made for the German and US armed forces. This is more aimed at the civilian market, the everyday chronograph, you know. It's fantastically elegant, but yet has all the benefits of the turning bezel, the red pusher, the the, the functionality, the robustness, all of that good stuff for every day. And I think it really translates. And I think more people should be talking about this brand, undoubtedly. At number four is a watch I previously also reviewed, the Vulcane Nautical Alarm. This faithful reissue of a highly innovative diver of the early 1960s is basically what Vulcane are famous for, their mechanical alarm cricket watches, but crucially utilized this time for diving. A no-brainer if I ever saw one. This uber-complicated proprietary-made hand-wound alarm is equipped with an Xactomatic system a special triple case back that acts as a resonance chamber, allowing the alarm to function underwater to 300 meters, no less. A truly unique diver, it makes for a great useful tool that you can actually use in professional diving situations or every day. And yes, I did test it, and it can in fact wake you up from sleep. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, we got a YouTube video to make. Ugh. And number three is something truly surprising. Not for what it is, but who it's by. This Rolex is a 1930s inspired dress watch that replaces the unfortunately now put to bed Cellini line. What makes this watch scratch bewildered heads is that it comes from the world's most famous, desired and equally despised luxury watchmaker. Love it or loathe it, it's something different from the brand that we mock year upon year for its incremental updates that fans go absolutely gaga for with endless videos of vapid talk of value and the market speculation to ad nauseum. The 1908 is so traditionally styled, if you actually took Rolex off the dial and put VC, GP or Patek, you'd believe it was them. Now, most people will just roll their eyes because most people, as Mike from RLM says, they just love endless trash. But this is for those who want a little bit more refinement, the least tainted Rolex. It's also an important, subtle, but firm nod to say, yeah, we can make this too, hence the display back. It's easy to forget that Rolex is not just for keeping up with the Philistines, cancel-worthy stereotypes dressed like Liberace, and all the parasitic, soulless, clickbait wheeler dealers. At number two, the Squale Consubin Palombari collaboration. A truly historic moment for this independent Swiss-Italian watchmaker as only a handful of prestigious brands have ever been officially endorsed by this elite special operations unit of the Marina Militare. For those that missed my video on them, they are the modern descendants of the infamous Decima Flotilla Mas, the world's first combat divers that inspired the US Navy SEALs, the UK's SBS, and every other military divers around the world that came after. The watch is based on their most important and emblematic Squale Master case design, however, in grade five titanium. One of my favorite aspects of this new piece is that sandwich dial. It's a bit of a cheeky, playful swipe under the chin towards uh, the Consubin's previous official choice, which was, of course, Panerai, which I, I adore Panerai, as you see there. But this is the first Squale I've ever seen with that. Regardless, it is a moment in history that is very important because it solidifies the brand's position as one of the best Swiss watch or Swiss dive watch makers of all time, especially in their price range.
Grand Seiko is my final favorite release for 2023. And you're probably wondering why I have not purchased it yet. I'll get to that in just a moment. But finally, there is a really compelling solid selection of 36 mm unisex intended mid-sized versions of the godfather of all Grand Seikos, the 1967 reference 44GS, AKA the watch that introduced the brand's signature grammar of design, their distinctive language of shapes, traits, and proportions that has been key to putting Grand before Seiko. It's difficult to pick a favorite, but I'd probably go for the SBGW299, rich blue somber style, but alas, I'm steering well clear of them for now until I finally make that trip to Japan. As I've mentioned a million times, I want to buy a GS to commemorate that once in a lifetime bucket list adventure. Trigger warning here, do not be offended by any of this. This is just merely my humble opinion. As I said in the previous video, vai a trovare tuo palle. First of all, what went through my mind is how stupid am I to actually volunteer for this. Unbelievably painful. At number 10, it's the Casino Tourbillon by Jacob & Co. While the idea, I must admit, is kind of cool, a watch with a mechanically functioning roulette wheel, which is certainly impressive from a technical engineering perspective, the execution, however, still looks like something you get in a Christmas cracker or a Las Vegas airport gift shop. But to give them credit, this is the least offensive Jacob & Co watch to date. There is no other brand I can think of where I've despised every watch they ever put out, not even Richard Mille. Remember the Godfather watch? I'm really surprised that whoever came up with that idea is not sleeping with the fishes. At nine, speaking of Richard Mille, yes, the 80s are back in the worst way possible with the RM07-01, an automatic with colored ceramics. You guys know I love watches of the 80s, but this is more for Harry Enfield's loads of money. Look all you scum all sitting out here. <laughs> oh, I'm worried about my mortgage, worried about my job. Oh, when's the recession gonna end? Recession? What recession? Oh, I've got loads of money! <laughs> Luxury has never looked so cheap. But wait, we are only at number nine, and as Pinhead says, We have such sights to show you. <laughs> at eight, it's not just one watch, but an entire brand. 2023 will be the year Patek lost a lot of my respect. If you look up the definition of the word vile, and you don't see an illustration of this Aquanaut Rainbow Minute Repeater, then Dr. Johnson has messed up again. Sausage? Sausage? Blast your eyes! The Patek 607G Calatrava in various colorways is by far not the most garishly vulgar looking Patek, but why I despise this watch in particular is to me, when I think of Patek Calatrava, I immediately envisage quintessentially chic and dressy affairs, not something trying to be hip. It's kind of like your grandfather starring in a drill video and not in the cool way like Pete and Baz. Makes it back down and shut your mouth. This year, Patek released about 24 or so new watches. Not one had any semblance of class whatsoever. So much so, I think they should be excommunicated from the so-called Holy Trinity and be replaced by JLC or ALS or Breguet. Who are these watches for? Is it a brand only for football managers and, and crime lords now? Next at seven is not a particular watch, but a new genre of watch, you could say, when respectable brands like G-Shock, Oris, Longines and others team up with all special editions with watch publications to feed off the hype. With the death of true watch journalism and most of them merely becoming shilling fronts for their own watch stores, in my opinion, it's not a good look for the brands involved. On a positive note, there were some really cool and logical collabs that worked, 
Point and Case, Tag Heuer and Porsche. I'm sure there are going to be comments saying, well, what's the difference when I collaborate with brands? And the truth is, it's a massive difference. You see, they are supposed to report on watches, not sell them, even though that's basically what they do now. To me, that cheapens the watch, you know, just putting out a different dial, a different color bezel, whatever, right? They're not supposed to do that, and they do it far too much. I limit myself to a few collaborations a year. I don't want to dilute those brands. I want to make something special every time. It comes from a place of passion. It comes from a place of enthusiasm, of making something that I want to enjoy myself, but also hopefully you will enjoy. It's not a cash grab. And what they're doing is a cash grab. And that is the fundamental difference between us. The Rolex Day Date Puzzle Dial and Oyster Perpetual Celebration is my number six. Just when you thought things were getting classy with the 1908, they introduce an emetic causing duo that both look like the diuretic effluence of Polka Dot Man. If you want something colorful, fun, light-hearted, I really love the 2023 Swatch Seconds of Sweetness. Now that is cool. At number five is a watch I simply cannot be bothered to explain because there's not much there. It's the J12 Cybernetic Watch by Chanel. So what's the big deal? Aside from being very generically ugly. Well, it costs 14 grand. The horror, horror, the horror, horror. Talking of fashion brands making watches, at number four, it's not just one abomination of horology, but two, the Louis Vuitton Fiery Heart Automata and Tambour Opera Automata. One looks like an Ed Hardy t-shirt on LSD, and the other an equally bad trip, Puccini's Tarandot on shrooms. It's fair to say that LV should stick to their tacky, monogrammed, overpriced and badly made bags. At almost 600,000 bucks, each disgusting, and even if you have DuckTales money. Number three is a brand I actually really adore, and we're talking about Breitling. In the same year, they put out an insanely cool macho, ready to chew bubblegum and kick ass with the Avenger B01 Chronograph 44 Night Mission. They also put out the top time B21 Ford Mustang. Now, is it me or does it look kind of like some kind of fake watch? Albeit, I'm sure a beautifully made one, but at $47,000, who is this made for and why? The top timers of old were so refined, restrained, even James Bond had a modded one. It makes me slightly worry about their recent acquisition of another beloved brand, Universal Genève. You know, if I had a crystal ball, right, I could see into the future, it'd be like 44 millimeters, Evil Nina reissue, rose gold, tourbillon in the middle of a green dial for no reason whatsoever, limited edition, 70 grand, Universal Genève by Breitling. Yeah. At number two, AP with their 1017 ALYX. 9SM collaboration. Now, I have no idea what all these numbers and words mean. Apparently, it's some kind of fashion brand helmed by Matthew M. Williams. And I quote, according to Wikipedia, takes cues from skate, punk, and club subcultures in California and New York, end quote. The result is a Royal Oak Chrono with no functional markings for the sub-dials, which remind me of those ghastly movement fashion watches that were all the rage a few years back about as useful as a eunuch in a sperm bank. I think it's clear that they should stick to designing clothes and not desecrating icons of horology. Ma cos'è questa roba? È, è un scherzo, è un giocatolo. Che schifo, che schifo. At number one, well, rather unsurprisingly, is Hublot. And a quick observation, this year alone, Hublot introduced 40 new timepieces that varied wildly in a kind of sporadic shooting from the hip manner 
That makes me wonder if they're just trying to burn money. But profits apparently are still up, despite the vast majority of them being so gaudy they would make the ostentatious Louis XIV blush. And some I actually like. I've discussed before how the greatest and most prestigious car designer the world has ever seen, Giorgetto Giugiaro, owns the classic originals. I love the 38mm Fusion, and I've even considered owning one, just to annoy the blowhard Vigliacchi watch snobs. So which did I choose? Well, the Hublot MP-15, the Takashi Murakami Turbion in Sapphire. While technically impressive, aesthetically it borrows from the famous Japanese artist's flower motif, complete with his signature psychotropic and slightly sinister smiling cartoon face, resulting in something so despicably bankrupt of charm, it makes me wonder if the fentanyl crisis has reached the design offices of Hublot. But Hublot are not alone in using these organic shapes for horological nightmare fuel. I applauded it for being different! It broke new ground! The deluded new money bubble of the super rich and their unquestionable desire for ever more outlandish frivolity has also spurred on MBNF to greatly embrace this style to also insult your eyes. So there we have it guys. I'd just like to take a moment to thank you all for the tremendous support this year. It's been an amazing one. Germany, Italy, all the crazy, crazy watches we've looked at. It's been fantastic. Thank you for accompanying me on this journey. Next year, hopefully much more, or hopefully definitely a lot more to come. So uh, stay tuned. Happy holidays. And if you celebrate it, happy Christmas as well. I hope you have a wonderful start to the new year. I will catch you then. Uh, oh, and don't forget to like this video. And you know what I'm going to say, especially if you want to see more free and independent content like this. Catch you in the next one. Onwards and upwards. Ciao.